1985, Origin, Oregon. The Thompson family went missing whilst under investigation for tax evasion. Police were called to the Thompson's home after neighbors reported hearing keening noises emanating from inside. Home interior was furnished with unusual exotic items and furniture. Police searched Mr. Thompson's basement den and discovered a second room behind a curtain. This room connected to another not included in the house floor plan. What was initially believed to be an unauthorized extension connected to another room. And another. To this day, the Thompson extension has never been fully explored due to its gargantuan size. The Thompson family remain missing. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number three. It's my third day in the initial section of the Thompson Extension, officially designated as Threshold Commencement Zone. I am the lead anthropologist, brought in to analyze the cultural remnants and psychological effects of this environment. The descent from the Thompson Den to the Threshold Commencement Zone was less a transition in space than in time. The mid-century decor, the heavy drapes, the peculiarly lush carpets underfoot. It's as if I've stepped into a 1970s fever dream. The air is thick, oppressively warm. Every breath carries the scent of hot dust, the kind that would rise from the heated coils of a forgotten radiator. This place is a contradiction, a sprawling labyrinth beneath a family home, adorned with furnishings that suggest both care and haste. There's an office-like quality to the ceiling tiles, yet the low ceilings press down, creating an intimacy that's uncomfortable. It's disorienting. The fluorescent glow casts both light and unease in equal measure. Exploration is methodical, yet frantic. We've mapped corridors that loop back on themselves, rooms that seem to serve no purpose, staircases leading to baffling cul-de-sacs. The chaos of the architecture is mirrored in my own thoughts. Auditory hallucinations are common here. I've heard a child's laughter, the clinking of glasses as if from a distant party, and sometimes a keening that vibrates through the walls. The medication helps, it dulls the edges, but the sense of existential dread is like a tide, ebbing and flowing. I empathize with Echo Team, those sent deeper into the extension. They must be wading through a psychological mire. In quieter moments, there's an unnerving nostalgia. It's like being ill as a child, feverish, when reality warps and the familiar becomes threatening. I remember the weight of blankets and the distorted shadows they cast. It's that same illogical fear, the terror of the mundane. We all feel it, the dread that the exit the simple parting of a curtain to the den will one day reveal not the path home, but a gaping maw of nothingness. I... I must maintain professional detachment, but the truth is, I feel a mounting terror. I find myself rushing toward the exit each time we conclude for the day, half expecting, half fearing that it won't be there. End log.
This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number seven. I'm currently standing in what we've labeled the Culinary Conclave, scientifically designated as Gastronomical Array Section Delta. Access to this area was gained through the previously documented Threshold Commencement Zone. My observations today are disturbingly peculiar. The Conclave begins as an innocuous show kitchen, pristine, almost sterile, with a veneer of domestic normality. Appliances hum quietly, suggesting recent use. It's unsettling, the showroom feel, as if someone set the stage for a life that was never lived. Progression through the Conclave leads to sequential kitchens, each variation more chaotic than the last. It's like wandering through the evolutionary stages of domestic design, culminating in a surreal exhibition of science fiction-inspired appliances. They are reminiscent of set pieces from Star Trek, a show I'm told Mr. Thompson favored. These devices are absurdly futuristic for the era they represent, with functionality that seems ahead of their time. The question of how claws at my mind. The manpower, the years of construction, the sheer logistics of the excavation, it defies explanation. No single man, let alone one without engineering expertise, could accomplish this. Yet, there's a signature in the madness, a hint that all this springs from the mind of Thompson. Deeper in, the kitchens mutate. It's as if the rooms themselves suffer from a kind of architectural cancer, a parasitic growth devoid of reason or utility. This is where the hallucinations intensify. Phantom smells waft through the air, scented echoes of my mother's cooking. It's a siren call to something primal, yet my rational mind recoils from the darkened chambers ahead. I'm clad in a hazmat suit, despite the conclave's resemblance to the safe threshold commencement zone. The fate of Hiroshi Nakamura from Beta Team looms over me. His novel syndrome, birthed from this very place, is a stark reminder of the risks. I understand now the truth in those dismissed rumors. There's a morbid curiosity festering within me. The extension? It's an enigma, demanding to be unraveled. I wonder... Did the scientists of the Manhattan Project feel this same mingling of dread and excitement? Are we standing on the precipice of a discovery as monumental, as dangerous as the atomic bomb? The temptation to retreat is strong, yet I will stay. I must, if not for the sake of understanding, then to ensure this knowledge doesn't fall into less scrupulous hands. There's a responsibility here a weight that I cannot shirk. For now, I press on, deeper into the heart of Thompson's labyrinth. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 11. I've transitioned from the gastronomical array section Delta to what we've clinically named the recreational mimicry sector Gamma. More informally, this is the playroom. The entrance exudes an innocent charm, awash with vibrant colors and whimsical furniture, but this facade does not extend far. The air is stale here, heavy with the pungent aroma of PVC and an unsettling sour undertone reminiscent of sweaty socks. It's a scent that curdles in the back of the throat, as pervasive as the keening that permeates these walls. It's apparent that these rooms were designed for the Thompson children, Sarah and Betty. A whimsical sanctuary at first glance, the initial spaces present an almost cliched vision of juvenile delight. Bulbous chairs and oversized cushions sprawl across the vibrant carpeted floors. Tunnels of padded fabric beckon with their soft, enveloping folds, leading to hidden alcoves and secret chambers. Yet, as one ventures further, this childlike fantasy is progressively corrupted. The padded forms become less inviting, more constrictive. Spaces designed for play warp into a maze of PVC and foam that ensnares rather than embraces. It's a tactile contradiction. The softness of the materials belies the suffocating atmosphere they now create. This space, I theorize, 
was intended as a playground, yet it betrays an egoistic quality. Mr. Thompson's signature is omnipresent, his need to imprint his identity on every corner. It's a child's haven overtaken by an adult's vanity, a playground shadowed by a lounge for more sinister adult pleasures. There's a sleaziness that undercuts the childlike joy this place should hold. It suggests that the playroom was merely a precursor to something darker, perhaps the boudoir, which lies ahead in my exploration. It's troubling, the proximity of such adult spaces to where children once played. The daily return to the Thompson Den grows increasingly draining. The extension, with its keening whales and oppressive atmosphere, is a marathon of the mind and body. I'm certain this exhaustion is by design, a mechanism to erode one's defenses, leaving us vulnerable to the extension's more insidious effects. I've resorted to ear defenders to dull the keening, yet the vibrations are inescapable. They resonate within my very bones. The silence from the ear defenders has only amplified my paranoia. Even now, as I dictate these observations, I feel eyes on me, glimpses of movements in my periphery. This playroom is no longer a place of innocence. It's become a distorted landscape, a monument to the complexities and contradictions of its creator. As I ready myself to depart this area for the boudoir, I am keenly aware of the duality of my feelings, a desire to flee the discomfort here and a creeping dread of what is yet to come. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 15, from within the confines of what's termed the boudoir, officially the intimate quarter sector Theta. It's a twisted maze of bedrooms, each echoing the gaudiness of a Vegas replete with the depravity one might reluctantly associate with such a place. The atmosphere is oppressive, heavy with the residual stink of cigarettes and a cloying aftershave. Woody, synthetic, masking the hormonal tang of halitosis and the shellfish reek of unwashed extremities. As I stand in each room, it's as though they were curated for specific individuals perhaps women from Thompson's rumored affairs. The notion is absurd, the number of rooms too vast. Yet the beds tell silent stories of use and misuse, their sheets twisted, some still holding the warmth of bodies long gone. The televisions, inert monoliths in each room, face the beds with their blank screens, silent witnesses to the room's sordid past. They lack connections to the outside world, suggesting they were used for in-house productions, likely of an illicit nature. The perversion here is layered, complex, suggesting a man of deep and dark compulsions. The air itself is thick with despair, and each breath feels like an invasion of the soul. It clings to the velvet drapes and lurks in the garish light fixtures. I find myself scrubbing my skin raw each night, attempting to cleanse myself of the boudoir's vile taint, but it's a stench that seems to have seeped into my pores. The silence of the countless women who must have been brought here, the absence of their outcry, is troubling. Were they The thought churns my stomach. The signs of abuse, of control, are everywhere from the lingering smells to the disarray of the rooms. But nothing prepared me for the sight in one of the chambers, a room with carpet indented with what are unmistakably hoof prints. The bed was not just disheveled, but desecrated, covered in coarse hair that I can only describe as equine. The implications are monstrous. The disgust I feel is all-consuming. Mayor Green has insisted on my survey of the repository. The pressure is immense. Her leverage over me, undeniable. I'm trapped in this undertaking, propelled no longer by curiosity, but coercion. The toll on my team is also visible. 
we're all bound by secrets and obligations that force us forward. Each morning is a battle against revulsion and dread. Soon, I will be too far from the Thompson Den to return each evening. The prospect of camping within this hellish landscape is abhorrent, yet unavoidable. My resolve is fracturing. Fear is a constant companion now. End log. <coughs> This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 16. An incident has shaken us all. Gerald Vincent Harper, our hydrologist, suffered a severe psychological break following his work in the lustrate chamber, a section filled with an unnerving array of bathrooms. The nightmares he described were harrowing, and his subsequent attack on Junior Franklin was, it was unlike him. The two have since been removed from the extension for medical care. Mayor Green's unexpected decision to grant us a two-day break was both surprising and deeply relieving. This pause has thankfully pushed back the daunting prospect of having to camp within the extension's confines, a scenario I've been dreading. Now, the immediate fear of spending nights surrounded by its unsettling atmosphere has been lifted offering a brief respite from the tension that's been building. However, this relief is not without its complexities, as it comes at the expense of my colleague's well-being. Green's assistant presented each of us with a hefty sum, a thousand dollars, as we gathered in the Thompson kitchen. It felt like hush money, a bribe to soothe our rattled spirits. Still, we couldn't help but revel in the sudden change to our schedule the atmosphere turning almost festive once the assistant departed. The team is vibrant for the first time in weeks, making grand plans for our short-lived freedom. But beneath the laughter I sense a morbid undertone, as if these days off are a final grace. Two of my colleagues whispered plans of flight, of abandoning this cursed place, yet we counsel against such actions. Mayor Green's network is extensive, her reach long. To abscond would be to invite a different kind of darkness, one that extends beyond the confines of the extension. Yet I can't help but wish them silent luck in my heart. Despite the lightened mood, a chilling premonition grips me, a sense of an impending finality that I can't shake. I reassure myself that it's just the strain of the past weeks, that the extension holds no real power over us. Tomorrow, I will not descend into that place. I will breathe the open air of origin, bask in its unassuming normalcy, and perhaps, in doing so, I will dispel these growing shadows of paranoia. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 17. Just a few hours have passed since my last entry. The night took an unexpected turn, I was en route to the nearby town of Four Bear Falls with some teammates, eager for the promised diversion of a party. Yet, as the miles started to stretch between us and Origin, a gnawing apprehension took hold. The fear that stepping away from Origin, even briefly, might sever my will to return. Concerns about what Mayor Green could do if I tried to flee clouded my excitement. Reluctantly, I feigned illness and asked to be dropped off at a motel on the outskirts of Origin, the Mary Rest. Stepping into the Mary Rest Inn's lobby was like walking into a scene from a surrealist play. The sight of a goldfish, belly up yet alive in its aquatic dance, was as bizarre as it was inexplicably mesmerizing. The air was thick with the smell of aged wood and sharp citrus, a contrast that was bizarrely comforting. The woman at the reception was another anomaly. Her auburn hair and dark, playful eyes were captivating, but it was her method of peeling an orange with a straight razor that truly mesmerized me. Such an odd yet fascinating ritual in this quaint motel. It was a strange, almost otherworldly welcome. This room, though modest, feels like a sanctuary after the oppressive atmosphere of the extension. 
Sleeping in the Thompson house always left me uneasy, aware of the dark expanse lurking below. Here, I can at least pretend there's no hidden depth waiting beneath my bed. The thought that the extension could extend even beneath this motel crossed my mind, but the absence of that haunting keening convinces me otherwise. After a rejuvenating shower, I'm allowing myself to look forward to the break. Plans to explore origin, to start the day with breakfast at the tea top diner, feel like the first steps towards normalcy in what feels like an eternity. Tonight, I go to bed with a sense of optimism, a rarity of late. Yet beneath this veneer of positivity, the inexorable ticking of time persists in the back of my mind, a reminder of the looming return to the extension. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway. Audio log number 18. My alarm roused me from a deep, dreamless sleep early today, driven by a desire to fully utilize this short break. To my surprise, my room was bathed in an unusual golden light, briefly making me think I had slept in. However, a quick check of the clock calmed my nerves. It was only 4 a.m. Compelled by curiosity, I approached the window, only to be met with a celestial marvel, a sun dog, a luminous optical phenomenon that creates the illusion of a second sun. This false star, manifested through the refraction of sunlight by ice crystals in the atmosphere, cast an ethereal glow amidst the pre-dawn darkness. Previously confined to the realm of literature, this spectacle was now before me. Compelled to experience the sun dog firsthand, I stepped outside. The genuine dawn was just beginning its ascent, painting the sky with hues of pink and orange, a comforting reminder of the world's quiet beauty amidst the artificiality of the extension I'd become so used to. My solitude was broken by her, the receptionist from last night, exiting the reception with an ease that felt misplaced in the early hour. Got a light? Her voice carried the weight of too many nights spent awake, or perhaps too many cigarettes. Finding an old lighter, I obliged, the small flame bridging the gap between us. The smoke twirled elegantly into the air, intertwining with the fading sun dog. Accepting her offer of a drag, we shared a quiet moment, the sky's transition from gold to azure, a backdrop to silent contemplation. The appearance of ethereal lights in the sky, akin to the aurora borealis, broke our silence. Have you ever seen anything like this before? I asked, unable to hide my intrigue. It started showing up a few months back, she mentioned casually, glancing towards the sun dog. Seems to get brighter with each passing day. I couldn't help but wonder if she was pulling my leg. Sun dogs don't just appear, and certainly not with such regularity. Could it be something else? Perhaps a satellite, or another of Origin's peculiar anomalies? Our exchange was fleeting, ending as a worn sedan pulled up, driven by a young man who shot me a less than welcoming look. As the car pulled away, a mild dizziness washed over me, suggesting the cigarette she shared was no ordinary smoke. Wrapped in an unexpected calm, my growing hunger soon brought my focus back to more immediate earthly needs. Now, back in the sanctuary of my room, the allure of the Tea Top Cafe's renowned 24-hour breakfast beckons. However, as I ready myself to venture out, the morning's unusual occurrences linger in my thoughts. A curious beginning to what I anticipate will be a period of much-needed respite. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, log entry number 19. Here I am, seated outside the Tea Top Cafe, grappling with the whirlwind of events that have just unfolded. Nearly an hour ago, I stepped into the Tea Top Cafe, nestled at the highway's edge, embraced by Origin's lush forests. The moment I crossed the threshold, 
I was enveloped by an atmosphere brimming with creativity. An unexpected scene for a small town like Origin, especially at the early hour of 6 a.m. Typewriters clacked, pens scribbled fervently, and whispered critiques floated amidst a congregation of writers and artists. I briefly contemplated turning on my heels and exiting when a vivacious woman with an immaculate updo and makeup reminiscent of a Dallas starlet waved me over. Well, aren't you a fresh face? She drawled, her ruby red lips stretching into a wide, somewhat rehearsed smile. I'm Martha Ingram, and this is my establishment. Honey, we always have a seat for someone new. From behind the counter, a man emerged, tanned complexion and bright white teeth that contrasted with a shock of hair, too black to be natural. And I'm Roger, Martha's better half, he declared with a chuckle, reaching out for a friendly handshake. Their hospitality was almost overwhelming, setting the tone for my visit. The tea top, brimming with artistic fervor, had been expanded to accommodate its burgeoning patronage. I was stationed near a window, a vantage point that offered me a front row seat to the cafe's peculiar charm. Martha described it as a sanctuary for the arts, where culinary delights and caffeine fueled imaginations. The walls were adorned with artworks and manuscripts, each piece a testament to the unconventional, marked by geometric intricacies and patterns that seemed to whisper of hidden messages waiting to be deciphered. My breakfast arrived, served by Martha herself, but a disconcerting discovery marred the meal. An unexpected clump of hair nestled in my scrambled eggs, reminiscent of the unsettling fibers I had encountered at the boudoir. Martha's inquisitiveness about the recorder in my pocket prompted a spontaneous fabrication regarding my purpose and origin. I claimed I was a writer, which she enthusiastically embraced as an opportunity to promote her cafe. Our conversation was abruptly interrupted by a sudden eruption of whispers, followed by a piercing scream, an otherworldly sound that seemed out of place in the mundane setting of the diner. With a swift change in demeanor, Martha rose from her seat, her movements fluid and urgent. Driven by a mix of apprehension and curiosity, I navigated through the crowd. Amidst the throng, I spotted a woman seated near a window bathed in the faint morning light. Her disheveled appearance, with sweat-dampened hair and a frenzied focus on her work, added to the surreal scene unfolding before me. As her hand moved across the paper with feverish intensity, her breaths came in ragged gasps, each stroke of her pencil imbued with a sense of otherworldly possession. The diner transformed as if the booth and its occupant had become the altar of some arcane ritual. Discarded breakfasts and teetering coffee cups formed the sacrificial offerings. The woman's artistry evolved. As if gripped by some supernatural muse, she furiously worked her pencil over the sheet. What I initially assumed was a chaotic scrawl turned out to be an intricate, symmetrical pattern emerging within a leaden, void-like background. With a graceful pirouette of her wrist, she wielded the pencil's eraser, carving out paths in the graphite realm. Almost as if in a trance, she then transitioned back to the pencil, extending the labyrinthine designs into these negative spaces, creating a push and pull between being and nothingness. The patron's reactions ranged from rapturous applause to almost ritualistic chants, their voices blending into a haunting chorus. Martha and Roger looked on with pride, as if the woman's creative outburst was a cherished family tradition. Martha, catching my bewildered gaze, leaned in, her eyes twinkling with an impish glee. Every so often, she confided, Origin anoints someone with a surge of unbridled creativity. Today, she is the chosen one, our creative of the week. I suddenly felt a suffocating weight pressing down on me, an overwhelming blend of sights and sounds assaulting my senses. Desperate for escape, I stumbled towards the exit, only to be met with a surge of bodies clamoring to witness the mysterious artist's performance. 
I found no solace outside as the ground trembled beneath me, setting off a cacophony of car alarms. Just as quickly as it began, the tremors subsided. Now, as I sit outside the cafe, recorder in hand, I struggle to make sense of the morning's events. Moments ago, I looked through the window and beheld the female artist still in her seat, but shrouded by a tablecloth. Dread grips me. Has whatever mysterious force possessed her left her lifeless under that cover? Meanwhile, the patrons are now swarmed around the creative of the week board, their excitement palpable. Martha is at the center of the throng, her expressions a mix of pride and anticipation. I strain to see past the dense crowd, yet I'm certain the artist's artwork now adorns that board. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 19. After my retreat from the T-Top Cafe, I found myself drawn deeper into the heart of origin. My journey was fueled by a dual sense of necessity, a gnawing hunger that clawed at the pit of my stomach and a profound curiosity about the town's peculiar residents. As I navigated the streets, I was struck by their eerie nonchalance, a bizarre calm that lingered in the air following the morning's tremors. I find myself unable to shake off a growing sense of unease and speculation regarding the brief, seismic event. Could it be the consequences of the excavations for the Thompson extension? This network of chambers and corridors sprawling beneath the town might have inadvertently compromised structural stability. While I am no geologist, the thought occurs to me that the extensive digging could have agitated a dormant fault line running beneath origin, triggering the tremors we felt. What is most perplexing, however, is the absence of any tremors during my explorations of the extension itself. This incongruity is difficult to reconcile with the physical reality of the situation. It's as though the extension occupies a space separate from the town above, not merely geologically, but almost metaphysically. This sensation of dislocation, of being somewhere else while still beneath origin, echoes the unsettling imagery I encountered in the drawings by the patrons of the Tea Top Cafe. These sketches, characterized by dark voids and enigmatic spaces, seem to mirror my own experiences in the extension, a place that feels disconnected from the world above, suspended in a dark void that defies conventional understanding. My meandering thoughts were abruptly anchored back to reality when I stumbled upon Ollie's groceries. It stood as a beacon of normalcy and a promise of the sustenance I so desperately craved. Crossing the threshold, I was greeted by the dim flicker of fluorescent lights that danced across the aisles, casting long, ghostly shadows. It was here, Amidst the aisles of this seemingly mundane grocery store that I encountered more of the unique eccentricity of Origin's inhabitants. By the vegetable stand, a distinguished gentleman in a crisply tailored suit meticulously scrutinized each carrot with a level of care and attentiveness that bordered on reverence. Meanwhile, near the cold storage section, a woman with an unsettling, perpetually agape mouth cradled a block of cheese with a tenderness and affection usually reserved for a newborn child. At the sandwich counter, my seemingly simple request for a turkey sandwich took an unexpected turn. The attendant was a woman whose beehive hairdo seemed to be a time capsule from a bygone era. Every sandwich is a journey, sir. Where would you like to go today? She mused her words laced with a profundity that seemed out of place in the context of a sandwich order. I attempted to inject some levity into the conversation with a jest, somewhere fulfilling, perhaps. As our exchange veered towards the topic of the recent earthquake, her response was a blank stare accompanied by an oblivious, Earthquake? While I waited for my sandwich, I spotted a woman with wild white hair and layers of vibrant clothing that distinguished her in the dimly lit aisles. She bore a resemblance to a nosy woman I had seen peering through the curtains of a house neighboring the Thompson residence. 
Could they be sisters, perhaps? This woman, with an almost comically exaggerated glance around, proceeded to slide a jar of iridescent honeycomb down the front of her blouse. The act was so unexpected and brazen that I almost chuckled. She was interrupted by the manager's weary reprimand. Not again. You're banned from here, remember? He sighed, a blend of frustration and resignation in his tone. The woman, feigning innocence yet laced with defiance, retorted, Well, where else am I supposed to get my groceries? This is the only store in origin that gets anything from the outside. What do you expect me to do? Eat the poisonous muck growing here? The implications of her words caught my attention. The manager, his patience wearing thin, suggested she enlist someone else for her shopping, possibly her sister, to which she snorted dismissively. His final warning about calling the sheriff seemed to be a well-tread path in their interactions. It was at this juncture I found myself intervening, offering to pay for her pilfered items, a gesture that seemed to amuse her. With a resigned acceptance, the manager left us, indirectly placing the shoplifter under my watch. Before any further discussion could take place, a tremor shook the store, dislodging cans and flickering lights overhead. Yet the locals, in an almost trance-like state, continued their shopping unfazed. The woman, catching my concern, shared, Most folks here don't even notice when the world is crumbling beneath their feet. They're ensnared in the town's enchantment, blissfully ignorant. Her acknowledgement of the tremor and her cryptic insight into the town intrigued me. And you? Aren't you caught in this... Enchantment? I queried, seeking to understand her resistance to the pervasive aura of origin. Her response whispered with a gravity that belied her eccentric appearance. I've been around long enough to see the layers behind the veil, and trust me, Origin's madness runs deeper than you can fathom. Her declaration that all of Origin was tainted, especially since the disturbance of something she called the Old Grey Lump, in Haven Ridge, the neighborhood where the Thompson home is located, piqued my curiosity and concern. Her sudden vice-like grip on my wrist and the intensity of her warning underscored the seriousness of her message. It's not too late to leave, she whispered, a statement that chilled me to the core. My hesitance and fear were palpable in my response, revealing my vulnerability. I can't. I stuttered. Her offer to expose me to the truths that lurked within Origin, should my own experiences not be deterrent enough, was both a threat and an invitation. Quick to collect my sandwich and address the financial dues incurred by the woman's shoplifting spree, I approached the counter, laying down a sum that I hoped would cover the costs and then some. The manager, his face an intricate blend of gratitude for the payment and wariness towards the troublemaker's advocate, couldn't help but offer a piece of unsolicited advice. Be wary of that one. She's nothing but trouble. His words, laden with a history of encounters no doubt similar to mine, hung in the air. Stepping outside Ollie's groceries, the sight that greeted me was almost picturesque in its oddity. The woman, was in the midst of loading her acquisitions into an aged estate car chaotically filled with an eclectic mix of canned goods and potted plants. I'm Adrian Holloway, I offered. Pleasure, Mr. Holloway. I'm Nellie Sanderson, she responded, her smile bridging the gap between us, transforming from stranger to confidant in the span of a greeting. Nellie's final act was a stark reminder of her earlier caution. She snatched the turkey sandwich from my grasp and discarded it with a hiss of warning, don't eat anything from here. With that, she climbed behind the wheel. As her car pulled away, leaving behind a cloud of dust and a trail of unanswered questions, I was left standing with a bag filled with canned goods and an address scrawled on a piece of paper. Perhaps I will take up Nellie's offer to delve deeper into the secrets she hinted at. But that can wait until tomorrow. 
For now, there is still so much more of origin to see, so much more to experience. Maybe I'll enjoy a picnic with the offerings Nelly left me in the town park. I'll indulge in the simple pleasure of a meal, even if it comes from the most unlikely of benefactors. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 20. I found myself navigating towards the town square of origin. The square serves as the heart of the community, with a quaint park nestled at its center. Here, the statue of Marilyn, a bronze horse stands as a sentinel amidst the verdant tranquility. The base of Marilyn's monument bears a plaque, a tribute to souls lost to the earthquake of 78, immortalized with the wish, may Marilyn gallop forever in their honor. The omnipresence of Mayor Green's campaign posters around the square is striking. Her overly toothy smile unnerves me. The tagline, re-elect Mayor Green for a stronger origin, seems to echo with an underlying promise or perhaps a hidden warning. I settled on a park bench, unwrapping the provisions Nellie had provided. Confronted with a can of oysters, the only one equipped with a ring pull, I had no choice but to reluctantly indulge. As the shellfish slipped down my throat, I grimaced, acutely aware of how I must appear to any onlooker. A man seemingly at home in origin, consuming oysters with his hands on a park bench. The absurdity of the situation prompted a laugh from deep within me. My amusement was momentarily distracted by the arrival of a middle-aged woman who took a seat on the bench opposite me. She seemed out of place with her nervous demeanor, constantly checking her watch before taking out a pair of earplugs and inserting them into her ears. With a notepad in hand, she sat in what appeared to be eager anticipation, a stance that intrigued me. A loud crackle pierced the air. It seemed that speakers were installed throughout the town, a network designed to capture the attention of every resident. A voice laced with a peculiar excitement boomed across the park, announcing, Good afternoon, Origin. The harmonics proudly present the latest live composition from the monolith. Let the waves of the unknown wash over you as we embark on this auditory journey together. As the music commenced, an uncanny silence enveloped the square, broken only by the emerging melody that seemed to defy description. It was a composition that intertwined the familiar with the alien, a piano at its core, yet adorned with sounds that my vocabulary finds hard to capture. The townsfolk, drawn by the broadcast, began to gather in the square, their expressions a mixture of anticipation and reverence. As the music swelled, a number of them started to sing along, their bodies moving with an almost religious fervor. Disturbingly, some of their mouths appeared unnaturally distended, as if the music itself demanded a physical transformation to fully partake in its mystery. Amidst this spectacle, the woman across from me, her attention unwavering from her notepad, frantically captured the scene with a fervor that matched the intensity of the music. As the composition neared its climax, the air was thick with an electric anticipation, but then, abruptly, the spell was broken. A visceral cry of frustration erupted from the speakers, followed by the sound of fists pounding in rage. The musician's disappointment was palpable, a jarring intrusion that severed the connection between the music and its audience. The townspeople, momentarily united in their disappointment, shook their heads and tutted before dispersing. Across from me, the woman carefully removed her earplugs and made her way over, opting to share the bench with me. I'm Joyce, she offered with a half smile. You seem out of place here. That apparent, huh? I managed a half smile, my mind still ensnared by the haunting symphony we had just experienced. Yes, I'm somewhat of an outsider to origin, I continued. The music we just heard, do you know anything about it? Joyce nodded the corners of her eyes crinkling with a mixture of concern and a weary resignation. That was the work of Mercer's monolith. The mention of the name Mercer piqued my interest. Mercer? Any relation to Alexander Mercer? 
I came across his name linked to an expedition in origin. Joyce's features took on a somber cast. Yes, Alexander was the brother of the mind behind the monolith, Freddie Mercer. Was? My heart sank at the implication. The town's been abuzz with rumors of Alexander contracting rabies, she sighed, a cloud of mystery enveloping her words. Dismissing the thought with a hand wave, she proceeded to shift the subject. I never met Alex, but I knew Freddie. I was his music teacher. He was a prodigy, destined for greatness. Then he disappeared, emerging two years ago with the monolith and its unique sound. The entire town seemed spellbound by his performances, I observed. Yes, she continued, a shadow crossing her visage. Freddie and his fanatical group of followers, the Harmonics, have quite the influence. They commandeered the local radio station last year, making his unsettling symphonies a constant backdrop to our lives here in Origin. This broadcast is a daily occurrence? I asked. Every day at one, without fail. He's working on his magnum opus. Joyce's voice trembled slightly. The thought of what might happen if he completes it, it's frankly terrifying. Her apprehension resonated with me, igniting a flicker of anxiety in the pit of my stomach. But it's only music, isn't it? Joyce fixed me with a look that seemed to challenge my naivety. You've witnessed its effect. This is no ordinary music. It transforms people. I've seen it with my own eyes. She recounted the story of another former student, a girl with a voice as clear as a bell, whose song devolved into a disturbing cacophony that echoed the monolith's own discordant notes. The last time I saw her, she left me with a haunting prophecy, Joyce whispered, leaning closer. Miss Williams, one day the skewbald mare will conduct a choir, but we've all got to be retuned first. That's when the void will shatter. As Joyce's words sank in, a cold shiver of dread crept along my spine. The townspeople, lost in Freddie's music, did indeed resemble a disorganized choir, their voices a haunting echo of something far greater and more ominous. My thoughts drifted to the void depicted in the paintings at the Tea Top Cafe, and the palpable darkness lying beyond the drapes within the extension. Could there be a thread connecting these disparate elements, weaving through the fabric of Origin's reality? I turned to Joyce, curiosity etched into my features. Do you come here every day? I asked. She nodded, a wistful look crossing her face. Yes, it gives me a semblance of control, Joyce gestured to her earplugs and notepad. Sitting here shielded from the sound, observing, documenting, it's my way of grappling with the unknown, even if it's just a facade of control. I probed further. Why not leave then, if the threat is as dire as you suggest? Joyce's gaze met mine, laden with a wisdom born of resignation. I could leave tomorrow, head for Timbuktu or anywhere else. But where could I really go to escape what's coming? If the void shatters, there's no running from it. Staying in origin, at least I might see it coming, rather than be blindsided. Ignorance can be bliss, I murmured, more to myself than to her. A sad chuckle escaped her lips. Perhaps, but we're beyond ignorance now, aren't we? After hearing that music, true ignorance is no longer an option. With those parting words, Joyce stood and left the park. Despite my instinct to dismiss Joyce's insights as mere products of paranoia or delusion, an unsettling chord has been struck within me. The dissonant symphony of Mercer's monolith, the cryptic art adorning the Tea Top Cafe, and Joyce's ominous tales coalesce into a narrative that's hard to ignore. It's as though all these elements are harmonizing towards a dark crescendo, with the Thompson extension sitting at its core, orchestrating the events that unfold around it. Yet, I'm acutely aware of the need to distance myself from these spiraling thoughts. The act of exploring, 
of uncovering pieces of history hidden within dusty corners and shadowed shelves of antique shops will be a deliberate attempt to shield myself, if only temporarily, from the creeping sense of dread that Joyce's stories have instilled in me, and to reclaim a sense of normalcy in a place that seems increasingly determined to unravel it. End log. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 22. My search for a distraction from Origins Mysteries took an unforeseen turn that has left me deeply shaken, a stark deviation from the solace I sought within the walls of the town's lost epoch antique store. My affinity for antique shops traces back to childhood, an inherited fascination from my mother, a hoarder of time's relics. These excursions were more than mere shopping trips. They were expeditions into history, unearthing objects that whispered tales of their past lives. This passion, this reverence for the stories embedded in the ownerless artifacts, eventually guided me towards anthropology. Thus, it was with a heart heavy with recent revelations and a mind clouded by dread that I sought refuge in the familiar embrace of antiquity. Upon entering the lost epoch antique store, the chiming of the bell seemed to signal a descent into another realm, one markedly disconnected from the quaint charm of its exterior. The interior, vast beyond expectation, was a claustrophobic maze of pathways carved through mountains of furniture and knickknacks. The air was thick with a peculiar odor, a disturbing blend of rancid meat and an overly sweet perfume. As old-fashioned music played, a merciful reprieve from the haunting strains of Mercer's monolith, I stumbled upon a bargain bin filled with cassette cases of Mercer's and the harmonics music. The sight was a jarring reminder of the mysterious musician's pervasive influence, even in a place I had hoped would be a sanctuary from it. The oppressive atmosphere of the shop and the unsettling aura surrounding the items intensified a sense of unease I had only ever felt within the confines of the extension. It was a sensation of corruption, as if the very essence of the objects had been tainted by unseen forces. This disquietude rapidly spiraled into panic as the shop's labyrinthine layout ensnared me, transforming my attempt to escape into a disorienting ordeal. Amidst the growing terror, I glimpsed out of the corner of my eyes the stalking presence of two entities that I could only describe as resembling whippet dogs, though their movements were grotesquely human, crawling on hands and feet. In desperation, I stumbled upon a half-open door, a potential exit from this nightmare. My relief was short-lived as the door slammed shut behind me, plunging me into the gloom of a narrow, windowless room. As my presence triggered the bizarre and surreal appliances lining the shelves to buzz into life, a chilling realization dawned upon me. These objects, their designs oscillating between retro charm and unsettling futurism, were relics from the Thompson extension. In a desperate bid for escape, I lunged towards the door, only to find it unyielding, as if held shut by an unseen force. Then, a noise, a mechanical whir punctuated by a soft click and sizzle of static, snatched my attention, compelling me to face the source. Among the activated devices, one in particular stood out, a television, its design a peculiar hybrid of past and future. The screen luminosity cut through the gloom with unnerving clarity. What it displayed was not a broadcast from some distant studio, but a point-of-view recording so vivid it bordered on the visceral. I was not merely a viewer. I was a vicarious participant, drawn into the scene with a realism that defied the screen's boundaries. The footage unfolded within the unmistakable setting of the Thompson extension. The 70s decor, the oppressive carpets, the claustrophobic ceiling tiles, and the ever-present flickering fluorescence, all were painfully familiar. The realism was such that I could almost smell the musty, forgotten air of the extension, a scent that clawed at the back of my throat. The person through whose eyes I was forced to witness this scene 
looked down, revealing hands and arms swathed in bandages, dark with stains that spoke of wounds both fresh and festering. As they called out, Sarah, Betty, their voice was a cocktail of love laced with terror, a mother's call to her children marred by the dread of what she might find. The children in question, standing in the threshold of the playroom, turned to face the one who had addressed them. The horror that greeted me was beyond comprehension. Their faces were not those of children, but of Douglas Thompson. The grotesque incongruity of his adult features on their small forms was an abomination, a visual affront that seared itself into my mind. Their smiles were a perversion of joy, a cruel mockery that relished the woman, no, the mother's dawning horror. Her scream, a soul-rending cry of despair and anguish, resonated with a depth of emotion that transcended the medium through which it was conveyed. It was a sound that embodied pure terror, loss, and the irrevocable shattering of a mother's heart. The impact of that scream, laden with such raw despair, was the final blow in a series of assaults on my senses and psyche. Overwhelmed, my consciousness retreated into the merciful oblivion of a faint, a desperate escape from the unbearable reality unfolding before me. Regaining consciousness, I found myself in a space that was a grotesque caricature of domestic comfort. Drenched in pinks, and adorned with an overabundance of doilies, tacky ornaments, and embroidered cushions. The air was thick, heavy with heat that clung to the skin, creating an atmosphere that was at once suffocating and claustrophobically intimate. I was slouched upon a pink leather sofa, its surface unnervingly slick beneath me, as if coated in a layer of petroleum jelly. The sensation was repulsive, eliciting a deep-seated discomfort that urged me to stand, yet I remained frozen, my attention captured by the figures seated across from me. The two elderly women's pallor was unnatural, a sickly shade of white speckled with crops of something reminiscent of black mold, suggesting an absence of life rather than its presence. Gray hair framed their faces, their sagging wrinkled skin making me think of melting Halloween masks. But it was not just their appearance that unsettled me. It was the aura they exuded, a tangible manifestation of the odors that had assailed my nostrils upon entering the lost epoch. The smell of rancid meat mingled with a cloying, noxious perfume, reminiscent of the cheapest toilet air freshener, one that attempts to mask foulness with floral notes, but only succeeds in creating a more disturbing stench. This scent seemed to emanate from the very pores of the women, enveloping them in an invisible shroud of decay and artificiality. Their eyes, however, were the most chilling aspect of their presence. Beneath the sagging folds of skin, their gazes were sharp, piercing through the miasma of heat and scent with a clarity that belied their decrepit exteriors. Upon realizing I had awakened, the women seemed to come alive with a grotesque sort of excitement. Their smiles, revealing teeth that looked like decaying peanuts, were unsettlingly eager. They began to bicker among themselves in a manner so garbled it was nearly impossible to discern their words. My patience frayed by confusion and a growing sense of alarm. I demanded to know what had happened to me. Oh, look, Lulu, our guest awakens. One cackled, her voice a grating melody of anticipation. Yes, Lucy, how delightful. He's finally among the living again, the other responded, her tone laced with a macabre cheerfulness. I pushed myself up, feeling the slickness of the pink leather sofa beneath me and cleared my throat. What? What happened? Where am I? They paused, their bickering ceasing as they turned to me, their heads tilting in unison like birds eyeing a curious worm. Why, you're in our humble abode, dear, Lucy began, which is above the lost epoch where treasures find their keepers, Lulu finished, 
their method of speaking in tandem sending shivers down my spine. I remember entering the store, but everything after is a blur, I confessed, the confusion evident in my voice. Lucy leaned forward, the wrinkles on her face deepening. Ah, the shop can be overwhelming to the uninitiated. Its secrets are many, and not all are meant to be found. Lulu nodded, her gaze piercing. You wandered where you shouldn't have, dear. The room you entered is... special. Locked for a reason. It's fortunate we found you when we did, or else you might have been locked in there for the night. Looking through the age-yellowed net curtains, I realized it was now early evening. The understanding that I had been unconscious for hours sent a wave of alarm through me. The possibility that dehydration and hunger, exacerbated by my recent dietary choices or lack thereof, could have contributed to my collapse, crossed my mind. My throat felt parched, so much so that I was unable to speak. Noticing my discomfort, Lucy gestured to a teacup on a nearby table. Drink up, dear. It'll help with the thirst. The tea looked uninviting, the milk within curdling at the edges, but my thirst overpowered my hesitance. As I brought the cup to my lips, Nellie's warning echoed in my mind, yet the need to quench my thirst won. The tea was as foul as it appeared, but it offered a brief respite from the dryness of my mouth. And what else do you remember, dear? Lulu inquired, leaning in, her breath carrying the same mix of raw meat and synthetic floral scents that permeated the room. I mentioned the disturbing vision of two entities stalking me through the store, a suggestion they quickly dismissed as possibly stray animals that had wandered in. I... I saw something in that room. It was as if I was seeing through someone else's eyes, I managed to say the words feeling inadequate to describe the horror I had witnessed. Lucy and Lulu exchanged a look of surprised excitement, barely containing their glee. Their earlier bickering faded into a conspiratorial silence as they began to elucidate the nature of my experience. Lucy leaned forward, her voice tinged with a mix of awe and excitement. Oh my dear, you possess a rare gift, more common among aficionados of the antiquated, like yourself. You're attuned to the residual energies, the memories, that objects and places retain. This isn't mere appreciation for the aesthetic or the historical. It's a deeper, more intrinsic connection to the past that these items embody. Lulu nodded in agreement, her wrinkled face crinkling further with enthusiasm. Indeed, indeed. And the device you encountered downstairs, it's a marvel, truly. It can translate this energy, these lingering memories, into visual and auditory experiences, allowing you to witness history as if you were watching a soap opera. It's been extremely useful for learning the history of the precious items within our little shop. Lucy added, her eyes alight with fervor. Her gaze intensified, boring into me as if trying to unlock the secrets of my own past. And you, my boy. It's clear to us that you visited the source of our most treasured acquisitions, the extension. You've been enveloped in its memories, now clinging to you, embedding themselves within your very essence. Lulu's eyes sparkled as she elaborated on their twisted theory. It's both a blessing and a burden, this connection of yours. The energies, the memories you've absorbed, they can weigh heavily upon you, clouding your mind and spirit. Lucy chimed in, her voice a mixture of concern and excitement. But fear not. The device you found, it serves another purpose beyond mere observation. It can help cleanse you of this burden, detoxifying your soul of the accumulated memories. It's the only way to free yourself from the heavy cloak of the past that now drapes over your shoulders. Their assertion that my experience within the extension, the vivid horror I had witnessed, was now a part of me, a spectral residue that needed to be purged, was a chilling prospect. As they described the process, their anticipation of my participation in this ritual of memory cleansing was palpable. They saw me not just as a visitor to their shop, 
but as a conduit for the very essence of history they so revered. In that moment, the allure of uncovering the mysteries of the past, of understanding the depths of my connection to the historical energies that Lucy and Lulu so revered, was overshadowed by the primal need for self-preservation. The two women, with their grotesque fascination with the past and their manipulative intentions, represented a path that led not to enlightenment, but to madness. I need to leave, I stated abruptly, the desperation to escape the stifling room overtaking any semblance of politeness. But you must stay, have more tea, Lucy implored, her voice taking on a pleading tone. We insist. There's so much more to see, to learn, Lulu added, her hand reaching out to me, the touch cold and clammy. Let's unlock these secrets together. Pushing the cup aside, I stood, the women's expressions shifting from entreaty to frustration, their hands grasping at the air as I darted towards the door. Their calls followed me as I fled, a cacophony of pleas and warnings that mingled with the echoes of my pounding heart. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway. Audio log number? I'm not really sure anymore. Following my departure from the lost epoch, the once tranquil streets of origin seemed to mock me with their deceptive calm, shadows contorted into grotesque shapes, each one whispering of today's horrors, while the flickers at the edge of my vision brought to mind the grotesque faces of Lucy and Lulu. How they managed to transport my unconscious body to their flat remains a disturbing puzzle. Did they get help, and by who? Seeking refuge in my motel room seemed the only solace, yet the thought filled me with a palpable dread. What horrors might the solitude usher in? How would the echoes of the past, particularly the harrowing experience relayed through that accursed device, invade the quiet of my room? I soon found out. The reception of the Merry Rest Inn, dimly lit and eerily quiet, was my first stop upon returning, driven by the mundane need for a can opener. The absence of the night's quirky receptionist was immediately felt, her unique charm replaced by a man whose very presence seemed to distort the air around him. His skin had a waxen quality, illuminated unnaturally by the lobby's flickering lights. His hair, an impossibly deep black, was slicked back in a style that seemed out of time and place. But it was his eyes that unsettled me the most. Dark pools of penetrating insight that felt as though they could unveil one's deepest secrets with but a glance. Before I could articulate my need, he extended a can opener towards me with an elaborate gesture, his actions veiled in theatricality. Looking for this, I presume? His voice eerily calm yet infused with an unsettling undertone suggested a discord beneath the surface your bag it's full of cans i see he remarked the smile on his face stretching wider unnaturally so failing to mask the calculating coldness in his eyes deep down i harbored doubts about his purported observational prowess his focus had clearly been elsewhere upon my entrance he hadn't so much as spared me a glance until I spoke up. By then, the bag, heavy with its tinned contents, was ostensibly beyond his notice. Indeed. Thank you, I responded, my voice tinged with skepticism. The moment our hands met and the opener passed into my possession, an overwhelming sense of vertigo seized me, plunging me into a vivid and disturbing memory that was not my own. I was in a dark, grimy kitchen, my hands, though not my hands, using the tin opener to breach the sealed confines of labelless cans. The contents, a gray, repulsive mass, were unceremoniously dumped into a bucket. The scene shifted, and I found myself, this other self, approaching a dark and filthy living room, where a gaping hole in the floor emanated guttural cries of despair. With a chilling detachment, the contents of the bucket were tipped into the abyss, 
feeding whatever wretchedness resided below. Upon returning to the moment, the man's demeanor now bore an air of theatrical innocence, so at odds with the aura of menace he exuded moments before. Meanwhile, the tin opener clattered against the counter as I hastily withdrew my hand, treating the object as though it were laden with venom. Where did this come from? I demanded, my voice sharp with a mix of fear and curiosity. His response was immediate, his smile stretching into an even more unnerving expression, one that hinted at secrets best left undiscovered. Ah, Mr. Holloway, every object Every trinket has its own odyssey, steeped in the essence of those who've once claimed ownership. This opener? It's a personal favorite of mine, he revealed, his tone dripping with a cryptic significance. Horrified, I abandoned the opener and made to leave. His laughter, a sound both light and laden with darkness, echoing after me. Once secluded within the motel room's confines, the door firmly locked behind me, I sought out an alternative means to access the food Nellie had provided. My hand found a spoon on the tea tray, and upon contact a barrage of flashes assaulted me, memories of countless others who had used this utensil. Unlike the tin opener's malevolent vision, these were benign, easily pushed aside. It has become increasingly clear to me that my sudden ability to perceive the memories contained within objects, a skill I've inadvertently discovered, may have been catalyzed, or perhaps even awakened, by the bizarre device I encountered in the lost epoch. The harrowing experience of witnessing what can only be a memory of Mrs. Thompson through this device seems to have shattered the protective barriers of my psyche unlocking a latent sensitivity to the echoes of the past that linger within items I come into contact with. This newfound ability to glimpse the history and stories of the objects that have always fascinated me is something I've long aspired to possess. The notion of connecting with the past, of bridging the gap between the present and the myriad lives that have interacted with these artifacts was a dream I never expected to realize certainly not in such a bewildering and alarming manner. The horror that such an innocuous item as a can opener could harbor a history so sordid and vile has left me wary of any physical contact with objects that might unleash another flood of unwanted disturbing memories. In an attempt to shield myself from this onslaught of residual memories, I've resorted to donning a pair of gloves from my bag. The moment I slip them on, a personal flood of memories washes over me. Memories of wearing these gloves during cold winter walks, each a tangible connection to my past. However, this momentary immersion in my own history pales in comparison to the relief I feel, knowing that these gloves serve as a barrier between me and the psychic impressions left on objects by their previous owners. I am grateful for this simple yet effective measure as it grants me a semblance of control over an ability I neither fully understand nor desire. The thought of unwittingly tapping into another object's dark past fills me with apprehension, making the gloves an essential shield against the unseen forces that seem to pervade the very air of origin. As I contemplate the vision of Susan Thompson, the realization that her ordeal is but a glimpse into the tragic narrative of her family's life weighs heavily on my mind. The fear for her, the empathy for her plight, is overwhelming, casting a shadow over my thoughts. What evils, what cruel twists of fate must have unfolded within the walls of the Thompson extension? The device in the lost epoch did not just reveal Susan's memories. It exposed me to a fragment of a larger, more sinister story that I am now inextricably part of. Utilizing the spoon with determined persistence, I managed to breach a can of peaches, the sweet relief of the fruit momentarily uplifting my spirits. A can of cherry soda followed, a sugary boost that did little to dispel the shadows lingering at the edge of my consciousness. Exhausted, too weary to tend to anything more, I now lie upon this uncomfortable bed, my thoughts spilling into this audio log in a stream of consciousness. 
the events of the day, the revelations and encounters, swirl within my mind, a maelstrom of confusion and fear. As sleep tugs at the edges of my awareness, pulling me down into its depths, I whisper a plea for dreamless slumber, for a respite from the relentless tide of memories and visions that have claimed me. The darkness of sleep, I hope, will be a sanctuary, however fleeting, from the reality that awaits me in the waking world. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway. It's morning now, and I find myself sitting in the relative safety of my motel room, sunlight barely filtering through the curtains. I've managed to consume more of Nellie's canned provisions, taking care to wear my gloves this time. The last thing I need is to trigger another onslaught of disturbing memories, especially not with that cursed can opener. Sleep, however, offered no refuge. Tormented by a nightmare so vivid, it felt indistinguishable from reality. I've been left shaken. In the vision, I believed myself awake, enveloped in the darkness of my room. A shrouded figure loomed at the foot of my bed, cradling what appeared to be a toddler. But then, the scene twisted into something far more horrifying. The creature it held wriggled free, landing with a disturbing solidity on my bed before crawling towards me. Paralyzed by an overwhelming fear, I couldn't move, couldn't scream. The being, despite its toddler-sized frame, bore the face of an adult, marred by severe deformities. Its bulbous body, grotesquely showcased by a black satin unitard, moved with a prideful display of its unnatural bumps and lumps. With a bald head, a slit for a mouth brimming with minuscule, corncob-like teeth and a pig-like snout, it inhaled deeply before planting a kiss on my forehead. That sensation, more mental than physical, coursed through me like a bolt of electricity centering in a throbbing pulse at the forefront of my mind. Then, as abruptly as it had arrived, the creature returned to the shrouded figure's embrace, and they vanished. Left in a state of horror, it took minutes before I could move again, rationalizing the experience as a bout of sleep paralysis, possibly spurred by the headache that now throbs insistently at my forehead center. Today, marks my last day before the inevitable return to the extension with my teammates. The dread of what awaits, compounded by this newfound sensitivity to the memories lingering on objects, is almost too much to bear. Yet there exists within me a morbid curiosity, a part that yearns to uncover the truths hidden within the extension's impossible reality. This ability, however unnerving, might be the key to understanding the enigma that surrounds us. My thoughts turn to Nellie. Her knowledge of origin, and possibly of the extension, might offer some clarity, or, at the very least, some preparation for what's to come. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway. A premonition, a sort of sixth sense, cautioned me against approaching Nellie's home by the main route. Something deep within urged me to keep our meeting clandestine, away from prying eyes, particularly Mayor Greens, who, for all intents and purposes, is not just the town's figurehead, but also my employer during my stay in origin. Heeding this intuitive warning, I took a hiking map from the motel's reception, embarking on a journey through the dense, forested hills surrounding origin. This decision while guided by an instinct to remain unnoticed, subjected me to a myriad of forest dwellers' bites and the unforgiving heat of the midsummer sun. The journey, both arduous and isolating, tested my resolve and physical endurance. After hours of navigating my way through the wilderness, I finally stumbled upon the dirt road veering off the highway and winding its way to Nellie's home. The house, constructed of wood so ancient it appeared almost stone-like, was enveloped in a cocoon of flora. Yet, despite its seemingly dilapidated state, there was an undeniable charm to it. 
bathed as it was in the dappled sunlight that filtered through the canopy above. It stood as if plucked from a fairy tale, invoking a sense of wonder and an irrational flash of fear. For a moment, I entertained the absurd thought that Nellie, with her vehement stance on avoiding eating anything produced in origin, might have lured me, an outsider, to her home with darker intentions. I dismissed the notion almost as quickly as it had arisen. Approaching the porch, I was greeted by the sight of an elderly dog, its days of vigilant guarding long past. It regarded me with a brief, uninterested glance before returning to its slumber, surrounded by an array of empty cans repurposed as planters. The cans, burgeoning with a variety of plants and vegetables, alongside bags of soil that I suspected were acquired through Nellie's unconventional means, painted a picture of resourceful solitude. The front door stood ajar, separated from the outside world by a beaded curtain that swayed gently with the breeze. The mingled scents of pine and burning incense wafted through the air, creating an atmosphere of rustic tranquility. As I reached out to announce my presence, Nellie herself appeared, her head emerging through the curtain with a near comical suddenness that belied the serenity of her home. Here, on the threshold of Nellie's world, I found myself poised between the known and the unknowable, seeking answers from one who had navigated the shadows of this town far longer than I. This is Dr. Adrian Holloway. Upon my entrance, Nellie greeted me with a presence that was both commanding and vibrant. Took you long enough, she chided, though her eyes twinkled with a mischievous delight. I had begun to think I'd overestimated your sense of direction, or perhaps your courage. I admitted to avoiding the main road, wary of unwanted attention, especially from those aligned with Mayor Green. Nellie nodded approvingly, a smirk playing at her lips. Clever boy. Maybe you're more attuned to Origin's whispers than I thought. Her attire, a patchwork of styles that spanned decades, and her lively demeanor contradicted her age, revealing a woman who lived by her own rules. She motioned for me to follow her into the kitchen, the heart of her home, where the aroma of baking blueberry pie filled the air. As Nellie busied herself with the final touches on our lunch, I explored the living room. It was a cozy, eclectic space, adorned with artifacts that spoke of spirituality and a connection to the earth. Despite my initial skepticism towards the efficacy of crystals and guardian angel statues, I found myself reconsidering my stance on the unknown, given the undeniable strangeness that permeated origin. Returning with a tray, Nellie served up slices of the pie along with cups of coffee. Grew the blueberries myself, she declared, pride evident in her voice. Everything here, right down to the water for the coffee, came from outside origin. You've been heedful of my warning, haven't you? I assured her I had, expressing my gratitude for the provisions she'd provided earlier. When I offered to compensate her, she waved off the suggestion with a hearty laugh. Nonsense, dear. Consider it a gift from one seeker of truths to another. For a moment, the peculiarities of origin receded, replaced by the simple pleasure of good company and nourishment. Nellie observed me with an almost maternal satisfaction as I enjoyed the meal. There's nothing like a bit of homemade pie to ease the mind and soul, she mused, her gaze thoughtful yet distant as if privy to secrets just beyond my grasp. As I savored the last bite of Nellie's pie, she caught sight of the gloves I still wore her expression shifting to one of mild suspicion. I opened my mouth to explain, but she cut me off, her intuition piercing through my intentions. You can see things, can't you? Through touch, I mean, psychoscopy. I was taken aback by her accuracy, by how effortlessly she peeled back the layers I'd wrapped myself in. Yes, I confessed. It started happening after after I visited the Lost Epoch. At the mention of the antique shop, Nellie visibly shuddered, her
her usual vibrant demeanor darkening with disgust. Those Van Horn sisters, she spat, I'm not surprised. That place, and many of its cursed relics, they're soaked in the energies of places best left undisturbed. What places, I pressed, although I already suspected the answer. The very reason you're here, she said, her voice lowering, heavy with gravity. The Thompson Extension. Hearing the name spoken aloud by Nellie confirmed my fears, casting a shadow over the brief warmth her hospitality had offered. I whispered the name back, a mix of shame and fear lacing my voice. Nellie nodded solemnly, then, almost to herself, hissed a curse directed at Mayor Green and her relentless pursuit of the secrets buried beneath the extension. She won't rest until she frees what's locked away down there. She trailed off, her gaze hardening. Curiosity overcame me. What is it? I asked, desperate for any insight that could prepare me for what lay ahead. She paused, considering her words carefully. I'll tell you, Adrian, but only so the fear of God drives you to leave this place, to run as far from origin as you can and never look back. Nellie's voice dropped to a whisper, her words weaving through the silence of the room like a chill. In realms where stars and darkness blend, where cosmic veils grow thin, Mach Aieli, terror vast, wakes hunger deep within. The recitation of the poem, imbued with an ancient dread, left the air between us heavy with anticipation. She leaned back, her eyes reflecting the weight of centuries of concealed knowledge. That's part of a larger narrative, recorded by the Anilaki, a tribe whose existence has been all but erased by time. Their lore, their entire way of life, vanished. Yet I've devoted years to uncovering and understanding their stories. It's from them we know of Mach Aieli, she explained, the name rolling off her tongue with a mix of reverence and fear. According to Nelly, the Anolaki encountered Mach Aieli, an entity of unfathomable darkness, right here in what would become Origin. In a desperate bid to contain its malevolent force, they transferred its essence into a horse, Wakaniki, intending to destroy the creature by sacrificing the animal. But fate intervened, and the mare escaped, eluding the Anolaki's attempts to destroy the evil soul residing within. To prevent Mach Aieli from reclaiming its original form, the Anolaki performed another ritual, entombing its sprawling body within a Stygian void, Nelly continued her voice barely above a whisper. They sealed it beneath the earth, marking the prison with the gray lump, a calcified sentinel, if you will. Her gaze then fixed on me, piercing in its intensity. And where do you suppose the Thompson's home was built? Centuries later, when Thompson Logging removed the gray lump to make way for the prestigious Havenridge development? The implication of her question sent a shiver down my spine. Everything changed in origin after that. It's not to say things were ever normal here, but removing that gray lump, it was like uncorking a bottle of long-contained darkness, Nellie explained, her voice heavy with the weight of years and the burden of unheeded warnings. I couldn't believe it when Judy, swept up in her ambitions and desires for social ascension, decided to move to Havenridge back in 75. I pleaded with her, tried to make her see the folly of it all. But Judy, she was headstrong, driven by a need to prove herself, to climb Origin's social ladder. She saw my warnings as jealousy, said I envied her newfound status, her marriage. It hurt, yes, but my concern for her well-being never wavered. Nellie's gaze drifted, lost in the memories of her attempts to protect her sister, from the unseen dangers lurking within Origin's seemingly idyllic confines. Judy and I were cut from the same cloth, psychically sensitive, but where I embraced our gift, Judy denied hers, twisted it into something else. She became the town's ear, listening in on whispers not meant for her, spreading secrets like wildfire, 
It was a misuse of her gift, a denial of her true self. The Thompsons, their home built atop the site of the gray lump, were a concern to me. Mr. Thompson, he carried darkness within him, a legacy passed down from his father. Susan, though, Susan was different. She had a light about her, one I hoped might shield her, protect her from what was coming. But the darkness of Havenridge, it's not selective. It doesn't discriminate between the light and the dark within us. Nellie's recounting took on an unsettling tone, her voice trembling with the weight of memory. May 1985 I went to Judy's, determined to convince her to leave Havenridge. Her kids were away with their father, thank goodness. Part of me thinks Judy knew, on some level, they needed to be out of origin. But when I got there, Judy was all over the place, jittery with excitement but kept glancing towards the Thompson house. It's going to be like Christmas and the 4th of July all wrapped into one, she said, with this odd excitement in her voice. But me? I felt a sense of dread, like something terrible was about to unfold. The air felt heavy, like the pressure before a storm hits. Then suddenly, there was this awful noise from the Thompson house. Judy panicked, grabbed her camera, and ran towards it. I followed, terrified for her and what we might find. Nellie's recounting took on an unsettling tone, her voice trembling with the weight of memory and the palpable fear that lingered from that day in May 1985. The details spilled from her in a torrent of dread and disbelief as she described the Thompson house on the precipice of chaos. That house, I've never felt anything like it. The oppression, the sense of sorrow and anguish, and that sound, a keening, like that of a dying animal emanated up from the basement. All I wanted was to grab Judy and pull her out, even if it meant knocking some sense into her physically. But she was gone, down to Mr. Thompson's den. Nellie's voice faltered as she described following her sister, calling after her, only to witness Judy disappear behind a curtain that served as the threshold to the Thompson extension. The dread that filled Nellie's voice as she paused was enough to convey the terror of crossing into the extension, a nauseating sensation I knew all too well. Nellie pressed on, her words heavy with regret and an underlying fear. The extraction of the gray lump, it was an unfathomable error. In doing so, Thompson Logging unwittingly unleashed an aspect of Mach Aieli's malevolence into Origin's midst. Yet. Despite this lapse, the core essence, the darkest part of Mach Aieli's being, remained confined within the Stygian void. A physicist friend, now lost to me, once posited that the void might represent a pocket dimension, an existent non-place beyond the reach of our earthly reality. Nevertheless, it seems a fissure was rent within this void, forging a passage a conduit through which Mach Aieli could extend a fragment of its essence back into our world. Her tone conveyed the gravity of the situation, a blend of scientific curiosity and the dread of ancient horrors. This breach in the void didn't just allow for a mere resurgence of Mach Aieli's influence. No, it facilitated something far more dire, a direct extension of its will and presence into our realm effectively bridging the gap between the unfathomable darkness of its domain and the tangible reality of our world, or more specifically, Douglas Thompson's world. My confusion was palpable, grappling with the enormity of Nellie's revelation. Are you telling me? I started, my voice a mixture of disbelief and dawning realization, that the Thompson extension itself is Mach Aieli masquerading under the guise of something constructed by Mr. Thompson. Nellie nodded, her patience thinning as though the conclusion should have been evident from the start. Exactly. The extension is but a facade, a veil draped over Machka Yeli's presence to mask its true horror from our world. 
The glimpse I almost had of its true essence was mercifully brief, Nellie continued, her voice tinged with fear. My psyche recoiled, saving me from a truth whose full revelation bears consequences too dreadful to contemplate. Judy was ensnared, incapable of perceiving the malevolent reality before her. To her, the corrupted air of the place whispered promises of a paradise, her senses dulled and deceived by Mach Ayeli's vile enchantment. Nellie recounted the desperate pursuit of her sister through the twisting corridors of the extension, a journey that plunged them deeper into the heart of darkness. Judy, bewitched by the false utopia Mach Ayeli projected, led me to a chamber of such malevolence. It served as the nucleus of the nightmare that had infested Haven Ridge from beneath. Within the chamber's center was a nightmarish device that was both a fusion of machine and organism. At its base lie the motionless, diseased, and vacuous form of Wakaniki, liberated from its malignant possessor at long last. As Judy's camera captured flashes of that forbidden centerpiece, my gaze was drawn to the unimaginable, Nellie whispered her voice a mere breath as she confessed to the sight that had confronted them. There, in the shadowed expanse, stood Mach Ayali, a presence so profoundly evil it seemed to mock our very existence with its grin. And then, as though satisfied with the terror it had instilled, it disappeared into the void from which it had emerged. The aftermath of Nellie's story of carrying her unconscious sister out of the extension left a silence heavy with foreboding. Nellie drew a deep, shuddering breath, the weight of her memories pressing visibly upon her. After that nightmarish encounter, I managed to get Judy to safety, or so I thought. I rushed her to a hospital beyond the reaches of origin, where the diagnosis was swift, a stroke, they said. Yet, the rapidity of her recovery her complete amnesia regarding the events. It all felt wrong, as if the very essence of what had transpired was being erased from our reality. She paused, a distant look in her eyes. In the ensuing days, I was on edge, half expecting some cataclysm, some sign that the breach Machayeli had created was expanding. But nothing happened. The world remained oblivious wrapped up in the developing mystery of the Thompson family, who were reported missing in the early days of June. My attempts to warn the authorities, to share the horror of what I'd witnessed in that house, were met with derision. I was dismissed as a kook, a madwoman ranting about nightmares and darkness. And so, with each passing day, a false sense of security began to take hold. Perhaps, I thought, the imminent disaster had been somehow thwarted, its progression halted. Her voice cracked as she spoke of her sister's return to Haven Ridge. Then Judy, she went back, discharged herself from the hospital and returned to that damn place. I was livid, desperate to make her see sense, but she dismissed my pleas, accused me of madness. It took every ounce of courage I had left to step foot in Haven Ridge again, to confront my sister and her family, to try and pull them back from the brink. A tear escaped Nellie's eye as she recalled the futility of her efforts. But one look at them, sitting there in their living room. It was clear they were beyond reach, ensnared by Mach Aieli's influence, blind to the danger that had almost consumed us all. It was in that moment I knew they were lost to me, lost to the world, bound to the darkness that had claimed the Thompsons and their home. My question, barely whispered, sought to unravel the final thread of this chilling narrative. Why? What made you realize they were past saving? Nellie's revelation hung heavily in the air. It was one of the many photographs that Judy had taken that night in the heart of the extension. A photograph of Mach Ayeli. It was displayed prominently, almost reverently, on the mantelpiece. No sane person would ever allow such an abomination in their home, or enter one where such a thing was displayed. And Judy, she had many friends, 
many guests coming and going all the time, it became clear to me that photograph, it wasn't just an image, it was a litmus test, a means to discern who had been touched by the darkness that seeped from the extension. So, much to the screams of protest from my sister and her family, I took it and left. Do you still have it? My voice trembled, both dreading and yearning to confront the truth encapsulated within that frame. The implications of what Nelly suggested, that an encounter with this photograph could reveal the extent of Mach Ayali's corruption within oneself, filled me with a chilling anticipation. With a solemn nod, Nelly moved towards an aged cupboard, her movements labored as if each step weighed heavily upon her. She withdrew a wooden box, the kind that might house keepsakes or treasures, but what it contained was far from benign. Extracting a single framed photograph without laying her eyes upon it, she cautioned, prepare yourself. Her gaze averted, she extended the photograph towards me. My hand, almost of its own volition, reached out to grasp it. The moment my eyes met the image, a bolt of confusion and awe seemed to strike me in the center of my forehead. It depicted a woman, not as I had expected from Nellie's foreboding buildup, but radiant, ethereal, almost divine. She's magnificent. I vaguely recall myself saying in a voice I barely recognized. That's enough! Nellie's command snapped through the air, breaking the enchantment the photograph had woven around me. She snatched it from my grasp with an urgency that bordered on aggression, quickly securing it out of sight. A wave of anger, so alien and intense, washed over me momentarily. You're tainted, she accused, her eyes alight with a blend of fear and indignation. You see beauty in Mach Ayali's venom, just as my sister does just as others in origin do. The shock of her words battled with the dissonance in my mind. The image of Susan Thompson in the photograph had been suffused with an otherworldly grace, not the shadow Nellie depicted. When I first met you, there was a brightness in you, but now it's being overshadowed. She paced the room, each step punctuating her growing frustration. Somehow, you've been poisoned. Memories of the vile tea from the lost epoch surfaced. But as I voiced my suspicion, Nelly dismissed it outright. Gallons. You would have had to drink gallons for it to have such an effect. She countered sharply, peering into my confusion. As I instinctively rubbed the throbbing at my forehead, flashes of the morning's nightmare intruded, of a creature marking me in a gesture that felt ominously significant. Nelly caught the action, her expression shifting to one of realization. Your third eye, it's been compromised. The implications began to crystallize. The nightmare was more than a mere dream. It had been an intrusion, a corruption. You're heading back to the extension, Nellie pieced together, her tone heavy with the weight of her deduction. Now I understand. Mayor Green has manipulated events to awaken and distort your ability for her needs. What does she want? The question escaped me, fraught with apprehension. Nellie unveiled a harrowing intent. The mayor's obsession with finding Susan Thompson, not merely as a missing person, but as a battleground for Mahkayeli's soul. Susan is ensnared in a struggle with Mahkayeli, yet she resists, locked in a stalemate, holding the darkness at bay through sheer will. Mayor Green and her pet, they're banking on your newfound ability leading them to Susan's hiding place. And when you find her... No, I won't help Mach Ayali, I interjected, trying to believe my own words, even as doubt clouded them. But you've already been beguiled. You see Susan, and by extension, Mach Ayali, through a corrupted lens. If left unchecked, you'll unknowingly serve its will. Despite the gravity of her warning, the allure of the extension, of witnessing firsthand the splendor I had glimpsed in the photograph, overpowered my resolve. I rose to leave, compelled by a force beyond my understanding. 
Nellie's reaction was immediate and severe. She seized a shotgun from the wall, aiming it at me with hands that trembled with the weight of her decision. You can't return to the extension, she pleaded, desperation and fear intermingling in her voice. I dodged just in time as she fired, the blast missing me by mere inches. I made a dash for the door, her calls for her dog falling on deaf ears as the old mastiff continued its slumber. Another shot tore through the silence of the night as I plunged into the forest, Nellie's warnings fading into the shadows that now enveloped me.